I want to invite you to grab a Bible and open up the Bible to the book of Jonah, which is in the Old Testament. Um, If you're like me and you're too prideful to look in the table of contents and you start flipping through, you're going to find yourself ping-ponging back and forth if you don't know exactly where it's at. But if you find Isaiah and you head towards the New Testament and you make it to Micah, go back just a couple of pages and you'll run into Jonah. It's right after Obadiah and right before Micah. It might even be just like two pages essentially in your Bible. We at Village Community Church have gone through uh, quite a bit of the New Testament since uh, our, our beginnings seven years ago, uh, approaching eight now. Man, that's crazy to, to, to believe. Um, and, and we're going to journey a bit here for a while, not, not too long. I don't, I don't think this is going to take us uh, too long to get through, but we're going to walk through the, the book of Jonah. You know, I, I'm, not a, um, I, I'm not the kind of guy who God spoke to, you know, like last November and said, all right, do Jonah in April. Uh, for whatever reason, God created me as a bit of a uh, fly by the seat of your pants. For those of you who have been around long enough, you probably know what I'm talking about, which is why many of you ask me good clarifying questions on Sunday to make sure that I'm still I'm in my right mind. Um, and, and so God just started to, to spring this book of Jonah on my heart um, a month or so ago. And because I started thinking, well, Lord, where are you going to lead us after we you know, close out First John? Uh, which, by the way, was what a life-changing journey for me. I don't know about for, for you guys, but for me it was a, a, a life-changing journey. Uh, journey and so um, we we end, we're, we're going to walk back not backwards but we're going to get into the Old Testament here and and as I've been kind of churning through this I'm starting to see uh, why God wants us to do this right now not totally clearly because usually hindsight is always 2020 um, but what I'd like to do is very very similar to what we did when we introduced first John. Uh, we're going to actually read the whole book. Now again, you're thinking, oh, I'll read the whole entire book of the, the prophet Jonah. Okay, it's really four chapters, not too many verses. So I did time it. should take us about six minutes. All right? Uh, so bear, don't bear with me, but get your eyes into the, into the book here. And what I'd like to do is I just want to read this. And, and then today we're just essentially going to do an overview of this journey uh, of some extremely compassionate, creative love that God has for not only his people, but the people that he's going to bring into his kingdom. So with your eyes, look with me at Jonah, picking up in chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down to it to go to them with to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us. That way we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me 
that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the whale, of the fish, three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet... You brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast nor herd, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city, and he made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he could see, till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, 
You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I, and should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and so much cattle? Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are coming before you to thank you again for allowing us to observe these words on this page that, that paint some pretty profound pictures in our minds of some pretty wild things that I think I can confidently say have never happened in my life and possibly, most likely, not in any of the lives of anyone here today. And Father, we're asking that as we journey through this today and in the weeks to come, Lord God, that um, as you have done some pretty supernatural things for thousands of years, we're asking that you would do a supernatural work in our hearts and in our minds to align it with your truth. Father, help us to, to observe the things in this that are the purposes that you've written them for. We ask that you would use them to help us to understand your, your character, your personality, the love and compassion that you've shown throughout creation and specifically what you've shown to us through your son Jesus. And I pray this morning, God, that that you would not allow me to say anything that would be contrary to your will, Father, but that you would just guide my heart and my mind and my words as we want to receive the truth from you, that you would change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As a father, I've wanted to be uh, instrumental in the growth of my children, in their minds, in their hearts. And I've also wanted to be creative. I am a creative person. I like to create things. I, I consider myself an artist. Uh, as a matter of fact, everyone is an artist in their own way, shape, or form. As we, God gives us the ability to create. And so, in my artistic and creative mind, I was trying to figure out a way <clears throat> to, to, to creatively instruct my two sons when they were younger on how to remember to clean their bedrooms. Not only that, but to remember and observe when things just need to get done around the house. Maybe in the backyard, picking up sticks. And, you know, we have a dog, so there's other things we pick up in the backyard after the dog. And, of course, as parents, we want our young boys to just be excited to say, Mom and Dad, what can I do for you? Right? You guys are good at it. You're good examples. But some of us need to be creative to help out. So I came up with this idea. As, as a guy who loves sports, one of the things I observe as effectiveness in sports is this idea of muscle memory to help them remember. Okay, so when a baseball player needs to learn how to swing a bat well, they'll swing a bat a thousand different times, right? Muscle memory. As a musician, to get good muscle memory with your fingers, you go through the same chord progressions and different solo things. You, you practice to make it what? Perfect, right? Practice makes perfect. This is all part of muscle memory so that you're not really thinking about things. You just kind of naturally do them. And I'm thinking to myself, how can I help my sons to have good muscle memory with cleaning things up in the yard when they see it or cleaning up their room when they see it. And so I had this great idea. And I went outside and I saw all the sticks that were laying around in the yard. 
Now, for those of you who mow lawn, you know it's important that you got to pick up the sticks, otherwise it damages your blade. So I invited my two kids. Uh, I, they were, what, maybe 8, 9, 10, somewhere around there in, in that age group. And I said, okay, guys, I got so, we're going to do something today as, as a father-son thing. I'm going to help you guys work on some muscle memory. I want you to go outside, and I want you to pick up all the sticks that are in the yard, and then I want you to get them into a great big pile right into the middle of the yard that we will get to burn later on, okay? And then I'm going to go in the house, and then when you're done, I'm going to come out, and I'm going to inspect it to see how well you have done because they know Dad's going to find more sticks. And so I went into the house, and I kind of watched through the window, and they're out there picking up their sticks. And I went in then to their bedroom, and, and I saw how, how messy that was. And so I went back outside, and I saw the sticks, and I said, guys, great job. Good job with the sticks. Now I want you to take that same idea of observing where your bedrooms are a mess and clean them up. Take the dirty laundry, put it down the chute, put your shoes back where they belong, make sure your drawers are closed, make your bed, your pillows, and you know, take care of everything. Okay, okay, Dad, we're going to do it. So they go inside. When, while they go inside, I took the sticks, and I just started whipping them over the whole yard. Just littered the yard with sticks. And so I went inside after they were done. Good job, guys. Your rooms look good. Good, good job. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to go back out to the yard. Come with me back out to the yard. And I want you to pick up all the... They're like, what in the world? Ha-? I said, we're working on muscle memory. You've got to repeat the things over and over again until you make sure to get it right. So I said, I want you guys to pick up all these sticks while I go back inside. I went back into their bedrooms. <laughs> Out comes their clothes. Just, ge- I heard one guy just say, genius. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> we did that a few times before the kids finally caught on to what was going on. You understand my concept, right? I, I eventually did help them out. I wasn't slave driving them. Okay, I, I didn't. I, I didn't. They still work to pay for my finances. No, I'm just kidding. Here's the deal. I came up with this creative plan to try to get them to remember, to align them and their hearts and their minds with some of the rules in our household and in our family. But you want to know something? It really wasn't the greatest plan. It was a bit creative and a bit entertaining and makes for a really good illustration for me to start off a a sermon But in all reality, I'm still a broken man. I'm still a broken vessel. There's still errors. There's still wrongfulness in my thinking and some of the ridiculousness of that idea, as genius as it is. There's a little bit of absurdity to it that I would do with my children. But here's the deal. I think with what Jonah is wanting to to, to tell us through uh, his recollection of this wild adventure that God took him on is this. That God, the compassionate creator, will use extremely creative measures amidst human choices to transform the hearts and the minds of his people. Now, this is a statement I'm going to say today that we will revisit regularly because I do believe that this is what God has designed for this prophet That he, as the compassionate creator, I want you to remember the compassion, will use extremely creative measures. I want you to remember that word extremely. Amidst human choices, which I want you to uh, resonate with, I know all of us do, uh, to transform the humans' minds, the the minds of the people. Now, how do we respond to that? We must be aware at all times and all circumstances as to how God is realigning our hearts with his plans. This is something that for the believer, okay, because I'm not speaking to to, to non-believers. I wouldn't expect a non-believer to actually understand the mind of God or even want to think about it or or even pursue it. So I'm talking to some believers here um, that we must be aware at all times and circumstances as to how God is realigning our hearts with his plans through extremely creative measures. And lastly, we need to be willing to be part of his extreme plans. Some of us are very adventurous in life. No matter what your age. 
We enjoy the thrill of danger in extreme. But sometimes when God wants to use you in extreme ways, we get a little, no, oh, I don't think that. No, that's, I can't do that. Oh, no. So that, that was a gigantic piece of manna for you to chew on in this as we enter into essentially the introduction to Jonah. Okay, so first of all, Jonah is a prophet. This is a prophetic book from the Old Testament. Beginning with Moses, God spoke to Moses and said, Moses, speak this to the people. Moses, speak this to Pharaoh. The idea of a prophet is that God would choose a human being to give them, first of all, a message to his covenant people, to the, co- to the people of Israel. I am telling you, Jonah, as a man, to go and say things to the people. He's not alone, okay? We have major prophets, minor prophets. We have the major ones in Isaiah and Jeremiah. We also have the minor ones here. You see Jonah and Amos and, and, and Obadiah. And here's the message that God, well, first of all, he would give the human the message, but he would also give them the authority to be able to speak it. So it's God's messengers. It's God's people that, that he would individually choose to go to his people with a message. And here it is. It's usually a message of repentance. A message of correction. You remember last week at Easter, we talked about uh, really the story from the garden, from the brokenness of humanity, that that brokenness just continued to spread. He calls Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'm going to make a people, a nation out of you under your name. That's going to be my bloodline people, Israel. And then he calls them all together and says, I want you to go into this land where I will be your God and you will be my people. He's establishing this group of people and Did they do it right all the time? No. He gave them the law. Not to keep. Okay, let me tell you this. God didn't give the law to people so that they would keep it. He says, if you obey it, you'll be perfect. To which we learn that the law was not given for us to keep. The law was given to reveal where we fall short. And so many times when God would call a prophet to speak to the people, the prophet would basically be saying, hey, Uh, Guys, God said through Moses, this is how you ought to be living, and you ain't living this way. And if you don't change your ways, there will be a holy butt whooping, essentially. And people have died because of this, because of their bad behavior. They died. So he used Jonah to to really prophesy uh, about this nation of Israel uh, during the time of Jeroboam the second, can I have my first slide up there? Because I want to show a map of the setting. Okay, y'all know I get excited when I get to bring my extendo wand out. So, for context, just to give you an understanding where everything is at. Okay, here's Jerusalem. All right, we tracking with me? Here's Jerusalem right over here. Okay. Uh, This right here is essentially where Israel is. Uh, Give me the slide. Go to the next slide. I'm going to probably have you bounce me around a little bit. Go one more. Okay. Here's what I want to show you. This is where Jonah is from. Here's Jerusalem. Again, this is a little bit more of a close-up. Here's Jerusalem. This is where Jonah is from. He's from uh, a place that is just outside of Jerusalem. Nazareth, keep that stuff in mind as we're being reminded uh, about the Savior uh, every week here. But here's Jerusalem, here's where Jonah is from. Here is where Israel's nation is and Judah is. Go to the next slide. Should be another close-up. Okay, so no, that's not the close This here I wanted to show you because right up here, Zebulun, is, is where Jonah's family is, where Jonah's actually from, right up in this corner uh, of this neck of the woods. This here is the 12 tribes of Egypt where God said, I'm going to give you all this land. This is all the tribe. This is all of who, where you're going to live. All this area right up here. So make note right here of the Sea of Galilee. Make note of the Dead Sea for reference points. And you can see all of this. Now go one more slide. This is more of a close-up of where Jonah's from, from this Gath 
Hafer place right here, which is very near Nazareth. All right. Now you can see the separation here between this nation of Israel and this nation of Judah. Anytime you start to see God's people separated, we got a problem. All right. You, we got we got issues that are going on. If you wouldn't mind uh, backing up one slide. And then be, make one more note of all this being being Israel, all these nations made up Israel, go backwards and backwards and backwards. There, sorry. This is a bit of a history lesson. I'm not a history teacher. I'm doing my best. Here's what I want to show you. Israel used to be this whole entire place. All was well, all was good, and all was fine. As a matter of fact, it came up even uh, further up into this area right here. But do you see this green? This is Assyria. This is where the, the Assyrians formed this army and, and they were coming and they were taking over all of this, the, this land in this area here. And this Jeroboam II or Jeroboam II basically was the king of Israel. He was behaving badly. He was, he was not repenting of the sins of his father and Jonah came to him and said well okay yeah you're going to still try to take over the parts of Israel he was doing a good job of of trying to take away the land from the Assyrians but he was still behaving badly so here we have Israel on top Judah on the bottom there's still bad behavior that's going on over here but the focal point of Jonah is actually going to take us way over here now some believe that Nineveh is still over here for the sake of my understanding in the studies we're going to we're going to understand that Nineveh is over here leave this uh, map up here if you would please because I want to give you a bit of history for Nineveh how many have are, are remember the Tower of Babel that situation all right uh, for those of you who don't the Tower of Babel was uh, a, a story back in Genesis where all of the people started to kind of collect to themselves together. They were smart people. They used the, 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 the creative nature that God gave them, the smarts that God gave them. And they basically said, we are so strong, big, and powerful. We can do anything. We could even build a tower high enough to conquer God. Now, that would never happen, of course. But God looked down and said, uh, Jesus, Spirit, we've got to do something about this we got, we got to take care of this situation and what they did is they they took people they confused their languages and spread them throughout the world and one of the people that that was noted first of all after this is a guy named nimrod i didn't want to start with nimrod because if i said do you know anybody named nimrod you probably would say yeah my brother Nimrod has kind of gotten a, a, a negative name, at least in my day, it was kind of a, a, a dig term, you know, kind of like calling someone a moron, you call them a Nimrod. Well, here's the reality, Nimrod was actually a mighty warrior. He was a strong guy known as a very mighty warrior, and he ended up over here in a place called Nineveh. It's possible that he kind of planted this location of Nineveh, and the word says in Jonah uh, and in the Bible elsewhere that he started a great city of Nineveh. Now, when we think of great cities, we think of something in our heads as, you know, maybe some great buildings and, and tons of money and affluency and people and things to do. And, and that's essentially what it was. It's a, it's, it's a great and powerful place. Nineveh became this hub in that area of Assyria as this really really great and powerful place i want you to know about these things because he god told jonah you got to go there what i also want you to understand though is back in israel things were not going so well well according to god's plan jeroboam the second and the kings there actually created what you and i long for a place of affluency, a place of luxury, where there is essentially financial growth. Things were going pretty well, actually, for the people. That would be the wealthy people. 
Part of the people were experiencing ease and luxury. However, some of the people who were poorer were experiencing poverty and injustice. I think some of us might be able to understand that and relate it a little bit to where we are at even here, right? We, we want to try to make all things good for all people, but sometimes you can see that separation of people where there might be people who have what we see as easier lives and some people not having such an easier life. But the problem was is that the leadership was bad. The sins of the king were brought down to the Jeroboam uh, the second, and things were not going too well uh, for the book of Jonah. If you wouldn't mind, go to that slide that shows the current uh, place, because I kind of wanted you to at least understand uh, where this area is um, according to uh, what our current maps are. Right here, this one here. Now, again, I'm using my computer to draw. Uh, I did say I was an artist, just not a drawing artist. Um, uh, this, I tried to just get basically what this map would look like today and give you an understanding as to where things are at. You can see where Be- Beirut and Lebanon is right here. Jerusalem again down here. And Joppa is down here. This is where uh, he got into the boat and decided that he was going to head the other direction while God was calling him to go to this direction here. And so this is just, a give, just to give you a bit of an understanding. Here's Iraq. Uh, Right here, Syria is right here. I think I said Baghdad here. Uh, One of the coolest things I noticed about this, there's actually a place here called Batman. (laughs) Hey kids, do you realize that Batman's not just a superhero? You can actually go to his hometown. No, I'm just kidding. And then Nineveh, of course, is is right up in this area as well. Uh, Could you go back to that same map of the setting in, in the beginning? You could just leave that up there. I wanted to give you an understanding of what a prophetic book was. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of of, of the history of where Nineveh came from, how it started, and also to let you know that Nineveh was really a a great, affluent city. But here's the deal. It did not have God's presence there. Nineveh, while being a great and affluent city, was filled with sexual immorality. It was filled with idolatry moms would bring their babies and sacrifice them to gods not god almighty the creator of life but there were awful horrific idolatrous things that were going on there and what god is calling jonah to do is to leave what's already a bit of a broken israel Maybe they've had a little bit of pride issues that rolled in. We're going to see some of that with Jonah in proclaiming to be a Hebrew, yet running away from God. But he's calling Jonah to travel about 500 miles to this place where it's the hub of an area that really wants to come in, consume Israel, and treat them like garbage. Now, imagine if God came to you and said, I want you to go to your worst enemy and love them. Go to your worst enemy and give them the goodness that I've given to you. And we're going to hover around that in the next few weeks because this is what Jonah was pretty upset and frustrated and angry about. And you know what? It's hard. When I'm really angry at someone, (laughs) it's not me that wants to die. It's them I want to die. And this is a difficult thing for him to, for for him uh, to, to, to do. So we're going to pause on that because we'll get into that in the weeks to come. But I just want you to know that the, where Jonah's heart is at. He's someone who's been called by God, given the authority of God to speak to God's people. Here's another interesting thing. This is the only prophet that is being called to go to the non-Jews and speak a message of hope and repentance. 
The other prophets were called to speak to God's people. This guy's being called to go and speak to the Gentiles. The people who would be considered, as the Jews would call them, dogs. The less than people imagery. So we've seen where uh, where we'll see where he we've seen where he's going from and to. It, 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 this would literally be like walking to St. Louis. I try to figure out about how far this trip would be. It would be like if someone's like, "Hey, uh, I want you to go to Saint, walk to St. Louis." Okay, that's like a month's journey. There's a lot that that he's going to be thinking about in the midst of that month's journey. Uh, as he called them to maybe he had a donkey okay i understand or a camel there might have been something that he got to ride on but in either case it's going to take about a month to get there but here's something that i want us to be reminded of remember earlier when i said the compassionate creator will use extremely creative measures all right i've labeled this entire series an extremely loving god because this book is a bit humorous in its gigantic proportions of what is going on. Has anybody ever seen any Tim Burton films uh, like Beetlejuice, um, some of the early Batman movies, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Anybody see that that one there, the newer one with, um, with uh, not Willy Wonka, but the actual Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with uh, Johnny Depp? Yeah. Um, what are some other... Uh, so Tim Burton, for, I, knew, I knew this was going to be a little bit tough, but I, it's the only thing I could think of to relate to. In the, when Tim Burton makes a film, you know, if he's going to make, a, shows an image of a house, it's going to be a house that is like absurdly larger than anything else. And there will be weird things that are kind of like tipped over and bent. And it's just kind of a weird, gives you that kind of strange feeling because the size of things in the movies are, are abnormally large for effect that's what god's doing in this abnormally large and weird strange things that are going on Uh, for for example jonah gets swallowed by a large fish now i've been enjoying some study time with my brother scott here and and he did a little bit of research to try to find what kind of a fish could actually swallow a man for one thing there really isn't i mean unless it's a shark that chews you up into pieces and swallows you but they're really it's just abnormally large that that this is happening how about the task that god calls jonah to go on to i want you we little jonah to walk 500 miles into a great city of gentiles and tell them to stop behaving badly. Okay? You know what that's like? That's like asking homeboy over here. How old are you? 11 and 9. Send in one of these 11 and 9 year old homeboys to Las Vegas. Okay, everyone. I just want to tell you, stop sinning. Now you're tracking with me. This is absurd. Not to mention when he says it, they all go, okay, we're done. We'll stop. He calls this big gigantic flower to come up and create a plant to come up and, sh- and, 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 and cover Jonah while he's sitting over there watching to see what's happened to, to Nineveh. And then he appoints a worm to eat the whole entire plant. Can you imagine the size of that worm? That's a big worm. He just mouths that thing down. Are, are, you, are you tracking with some of the enormous, gigantic, extreme things? Look, this is how God wants to show his love to people. You want to know another enormous, gigantic thing that God did that's absolutely absurd? That one man should die for every single sinner in the world that's absurd why not kill the guilty (laughs) then we'd have one man who is alive walking on the earth that's why 
But God uses these types of extreme contrasts to show His love to His people, His compassion to His followers. And really, I mean, who, who, who doesn't want to go to an amusement park and be amazed at the gigantic nature of you know, the trees that they would make, the fake ones at Disney World. Anybody ever been to Disney World and seen that, uh, uh, what's the, the floating tree um, from Avatar? You know, anybody go to see some, you ever been blown away by just seeing some, gig- anybody go to a, a museum where they like reconstruct dinosaurs? Like that stuff is amazing. And it's real. If you go to the Ark experience, there's things down, no, it's not perfect, but it sure blows your mind when you see that Ark and you're like, What? That thing? As a matter of fact, let me give you a little side trail. That wasn't a boat. It was probably a big box. A gigantic box full of animals. So the the extremely creative measures that God wants to use. All right, let's just quickly talk about Jonah once again. He was a prophet. He had God's authority. He was called to God's extreme task. And yet, the description we have of this man is that he is an angry, disobedient, floundering pendulum. That's kind of what, those are the words that come to my mind when I think of Jonah. Jonah was angry this whole time. We know that. Even in the belly of the fish. He didn't, it didn't leave him because it didn't take long for him to get angry. He was disobedient. God said, hey, Jonah, I want you to go that way. And Jonah said, right. Then he's stuck in this fish and he's praying. When I was dying, when I was faint, I remembered that I will still be in your holy temple. My prayers reached your ears essentially and you saved me thank you and god gives him a second round he goes to him again in chapter three and says okay jonah arise go to nineveh that great city and call them to repentance so he makes the 500 mile trek and he goes there and he does it but it doesn't take long for him to get all ticked off again when he sees god giving them grace here's a th- some, some weird to think about when i'm up here preaching to you guys i'm not preaching to you thinking i sure hope they don't receive the message of jesus I mean, that is, that pastor should be given several face spankings, okay? I want you to receive God's grace. I I want you to be changed by his love and to watch then his love flow through you and and to someone else. But here, he's like, I don't want them to know. No. I mean, God, if you call me to go there with, you know, 15,000 gallons of gasoline and a match, No problem. I'll go quickly. But we see this poor floundering fella, you know, yes, that is an allusion to the fish, (laughs) that he is a flounder. He's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Anyone? Anyone find yourself angry, disobedient, floundering around, feeling like a pendulum? I'm swinging really well in, in this sense. And then before I know it, I'm, I'm over here just not doing well. And you know what? It doesn't even have to be an action. It can be all up in your head. Now, if some of you tell me that you don't struggle with your mental thoughts throughout the day between God's goodness and what the heck is God doing, he should do it my way, I, you need to wake up. Because it's what we do as human beings. And God will use his compassion through creation and his extremely creative measures amidst our human choices to transform the hearts and minds of his people. Because he loves you. And his creation is actually pretty cool if you think about it. He's also a liar. How do I know that? He says... I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. No, you don't. You don't fear him. You're running away. Anyone? Or am I the only one? (laughs) 
No, I know I'm in good company. I'm thankful for our family. Here's what's going on. This book is not about what God is saying through his prophet, but what God is doing in his prophet. That's what this book is about. Not essentially what Jonah's saying to the people. Because here's the, I, I, I really feel like Jonah wrote this. There's nowhere where he says, I, Jonah, am writing this. But the reality is, is I don't know if anybody else could, I mean, maybe someone else wrote it down, but he told the story. He's telling his story to us. He's being vulnerable with, the re, with whoever's reading this and saying, hey, you know what? I was angry. I was ignorant. I was disobedient. I ran. But God, in the midst of his Tim Burton-like behavior, saved me through some extreme measures. And I want to tell the world about his extreme love. Lastly, the final character I want to talk about in this is God. You want to talk about extreme proportions. God's name between God and the Lord is mentioned 39 times in this book as opposed to Jonah's 18. That's something to keep an eye on while you're reading the Scriptures. Eight, 39 times God's name is mentioned as opposed to Jonah's 18. God's the one who tells Jonah what to say. God's the one who has the authority. God is the one who has the bird's eye view of what's going on in the world. Not you and I. Our view of the world mainly ends up right here. At the end of our nose. Okay, maybe not for all of us. For the rest of you, it ends up probably right here. This is what I'm learning. This is how I'm growing. This is how I'm changing. This is the stuff that makes me angry. Because as I watch the things that are going on in this world, you know what? I don't want to tell these people about Jesus. I'm praying that you'd remove them. Between now and the middle of November, our commercials are just going to be annoying. They're going to get, and it's not people really spouting off truth. It's one person calling another person a poo-poo face. And I, I just need to say that. Okay? But here's the truth. God loves the poo-poo faces. That's who we are. And yet, He's cleansed us. He's purified us. He's brought us into His kingdom, into His family, through Jesus Christ. And we're going to see how great and creative and extremely compassionate God is in the midst of this. Not only that, but because we are sitting here in 2024, we have understood and learned the truth of the gospel of Jesus' death and his resurrection. And you know Jesus referred back to this. If you have any familiarity with the things that Jesus said, he's talking about what happened with Jonah being in the belly of the whale. And so here's the deal. For us as Christians, we have to understand that the Old Testament points forward to Jesus Christ. You want to you want to play a little Where's Waldo game? You look through the Old Testament and ask Where's Jesus and you'll find him all over the place. Because everything that happened in the Old Testament was something in some way shape or form pointing forward to Jesus's coming. Now, he came, he died, he rose, he left, but he's coming back. And so what we get to do is go back through the book of Jonah and go Wow, there's Jesus. Wow, here it's fulfilled. This should be strengthening our faith way more than anybody else who read this before Jesus came. Because we get the complete story. So here's your applications as you go forward. Number one, ask yourself, how do I know that God is leading me? How do I know? You've got to ask that question. Have you seen some extreme things in your life? Have you hoped for and prayed for extreme things 
in your life. Now, how many times have you heard, we have a big God, but we don't pray big things? Okay? I'd be the first to admit, I have a little bit of a fear praying for big things from God. You know why? Because I don't feel like he's going to answer the prayers the way I think they should go. Who's trying to play God in that situation? All right? I know I'm not alone. So I think we should start thinking about what it really means to pray for big things in and around the idea of what it looks like for us to take the hope of salvation to people that may have not heard it yet. I'm not using this as a ploy for evangelism. But I think God's speaking to us that if we don't believe in a huge, gigantic, creative, extremely awesome God, then we're not going to live that way. And if we don't live that way, then we're going to kind of be putting along like a vehicle that's running out of gas. And we just spent about a year and a half of God filling our tanks with the hope of Jesus Christ. So think about what's going on in your life. When you're reading through this, by the way, you should read through this every week. If we're working through this, don't think about reading through the, look, like I said, it, by yourself, it'd probably take you five minutes to read it quietly. I'm just telling you right now, reading through a text and then closing your Bible and walking away from it, uh-uh. That's not how it happens. They don't call this the living word because once we're done, we put it away. It's the living word because as you reread it and you're praying and asking God to tell you about the extremely creative, cool things as to who he is, before you know it, you're going to walk away like your heart's going to be fluttering a little bit. You're going to be going, whoa, I don't know what just happened, but I want more of that. I'm encouraging each and every one of you, even you kids, like don't let your parents go by without you asking them, hey, mom and dad, did you read through Jonah today? Ha ha, parents, now you're in real trouble. It's not just my job. You've got to be reading through this stuff because God wants to tell us something each and every week through this stuff. So read through it. What is your character, Lord? Show me your character. Ask good questions. What is the character of God in this? Get on a piece of paper, find a journal, whatever it is. Write down the characteristics of God. I think you'll find patience throughout there. How do you relate to Jonah? Ask yourself. How do I relate to Jonah? How do I want to be a more faithful prophet or messenger than Jonah? How do I relate to these guys in a boat that found this dude in the, in the bottom of their boat? How do I relate to the Ninevites? How do I relate to the king of the Ninevite? What would my response, what should my response be to God? And lastly, how does this relate to what Jesus did to set the world free from slavery to sin? To do something about that which God was calling the Ninevites to do, to repent. Essentially, not just the Ninevites, but the mariners on the boat and Jonah himself. Calling them to repentance. Stop missing the mark and set your eyes on Jesus. And as you read through Jonah, ask him to speak to you. Father, what are you telling me? And show me, show me your extremely creative measures. Remind me to be aware at all times. And invite me into your extremely good plans for your kingdom and the rest of my life here on this earth. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for uh, giving this to us. And I continue to plead, Lord, that, um, that you would use this, use your word and your spirit to train us, to instruct us as Timothy heard from Paul. to rebuke us, to call us to repentance. 
and to open our eyes to the fields of harvest that are ready to receive this good news of hope. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.